Whole Hog Sports presents the basketball podcast of Mid-America, the premier Arkansas hoops podcast brought to you by Landers Toyota of Northwest Arkansas. Here's your host, Whole Hog Sports basketball analyst, Scotty Bordelon. Welcome into the basketball podcast of Mid-America. It is February 17th and Arkansas basketball has hit the skids again in SEC play. We appreciate you listening in today and checking us out. I'm Scotty Bordelon of Whole Hog Sports and I'm happy as always to be joined by noted Zach Bryan fan, Andrew Joseph of Whole Hog Sports and Bob Holt of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette. I wasn't sure whether to throw you um, a bone on the Packers or the Tigers because you're getting ready for baseball season. Which one do you like best? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I like them either or. The, the t- Tigers haven't been very good for several years, but and hey. baseball season's cranking up, I guess. Right oh. there in spring training, I should have oh, just yeah. gone with that yeah. to begin Catcher, with. Catchers and pitchers reporting, and there's always hope springs eternal, right? <laughs> <laughs> for sure. I guess the last time we recorded, uh, Arkansas had just beaten Kentucky in Rupp Arena pretty handily and looked like they had a lot of things figured out with five straight wins inside the league. But since Arkansas has dropped a couple of games against teams at the time, I guess we're either very on the bubble for the NCAA tournament or, or needing wins to kind of bolster their, their resume in Mississippi State and Texas A&M. Um, Arkansas lost to Mississippi State and Bud Walton Arena over the weekend, which was kind of a – felt kind of like a gut punch, like felt like things were going in the right direction. And – um, wasn't really expecting a home loss, to be real honest. I didn't walk into the building thinking that was going to be a, a, you know, we were going to be writing about a loss that day. And then opened this week with a 62-56 loss to Texas A&M. It's another, I think it was the third SEC road game that they've let a 10-point lead slip in a loss. And they also did that against South Carolina, but still managed to to find a way to win. Um, Arkansas has got Florida this weekend, but Arkansas right now 17 and nine overall, six and seven in the league um, with five games to go. Um, I guess we can start right there with the with the blown lead against Texas A and M. And I guess I'll try to ask you this question, you guys, this question more efficiently than I did to Eric Musselman the other night. Just we know that the team struggles to finish or close out games. But under that umbrella of the team struggles to finish games, what are some of the the trends that that you guys have noticed? To me, I, I think it's it might be three point defense. I think that's that that's a factor, um, and then maybe shot selection. What what do you guys think? I mean, just just looking at the last you know five minutes or so, of the game the other night, A and M. I think they were one of seven from the field, and I think four of those misses were threes. And it wasn't like they were down by 10, so they didn't have to take threes. And so I think maybe they settled or did weren't aggressive enough. Because at that point, you know, A&M, to me, or whoever you're playing, um, if you're up by a couple points, you don't want to foul the other guy. You know, you stop the clock, you give him free throws and all that. And so I thought, you know, they they, they, they needed to take the ball more to the hole aggressively, try to, you know, draw contact or finish at the rim or something. And then also they had some really, you know, some bad turnovers just and and then miss free throws. And if you look at the league, I don't have the stats in front of me. I should have looked them up, but you figure a free throw doesn't matter if you're playing, you know, Kentucky or the Kentucky Wildcats or Kentucky Wesley and, you know, free throws are free throw, but their, their free throw shooting in, in league play is not, has not been that great. It's been okay, but they've had a lot of nights like seven to 14, you know, rookie council, great free throw shooter. He misses the front end Devo really, you know, statistically good free throw shooter, misses the front end one on one, then misses two. So, you know, miss free throws, too many threes, too many turnovers. Yeah, I'm pretty hesitant to to place the blame on the defensive side of the ball for Arkansas just because I think that they have at least the potential to play at an elite level defensively at times. Uh, and I think maybe maybe some of their struggle comes from guys le- logging such heavy minutes like Ricky Council, Anthony Black, and Devo Davis. Those three are seemingly always on the floor. And I think maybe in the second half, those legs get a little tired. Uh, you could see uh, that maybe affects that aspect of it but I think the the bigger problem is their offense and you mentioned shot selection and I think overall just their their shot making and I don't think they have that guy like that one specific guy that you can give the ball to when when the other team's on a run 
and that you're in an offensive drought and you need to, to stop the bleeding a little bit. They don't have that one guy to go up there and kind of maybe want the ball and want to put an end to the bleeding. Uh, and I think that you could see that in the first half that this team goes as Debo Davis goes against a the first half. He was four, four for five, 11 points. And I think they finished the half up nine. And then in the second half, he shoots uh, – one of eight, Ricky Council goes one of six, and then all of a sudden Arkansas is looking at a, a six-point loss or, or however many was by. And so I think it's it's just kind of the offensive struggles, um, which I think Nick Smith Jr. should be able to help with eventually once he, he gets it rolling. But I just for right now, I think they lack a, a guy that wants the ball in the big moments to take, take good shots. Yeah, specifically, you know, Mason Jones. Or uh, JD, JD Note, Note yeah. yeah, JD Note. I mean, JD didn't matter if he was one for ten. You know, he was confident. And he was going to take the ball to the hole. And and like Andrew said, you know, if Nick Smith had been playing all year, maybe he'd be that guy because he's a shot creator. You know, he's not just a shooter; he's a scorer. But yeah, I think about late in the game, man, get the ball to JD Note. You know, clear out, let, let him create something, whether it's, you know, it's for himself or somebody else. So say with Mason Jones, obviously, you know, great, they had a great shooter and in, in Isaiah Joe and, and Mason was a really good shooter, three point shooter too. So yeah, I would, as good as Anthony Black is, and he's going to be a high draft pick and, you know, Ricky Council probably be a draft pick and all that. Um, that yeah, they, they are lacking that guy to, to say, hey, go, go in the game for us, you know. I think the minutes played conversation is is pretty interesting because I, I, I definitely see both sides of it. Like, I think AB right now is second in SEC games. If you look at Ken Palm and percentage of minutes played, and he's close to like 91%, which is, is crazy. And I was thinking, looking back at the box score the other night, he played, I think Devo played 39. Um, and then Ricky and Devo or Ricky and AB played, you know, 35 plus minutes. I think they were both over 36. And then you look at Wade Taylor, who's A&M's best player. Buzz Williams found, I think, seven minutes for him to sit. So he's, you know, he's A&M's best player. Still got seven minutes for him, 30 or seven minutes for him to sit and rest. And, you know, he's you know, pretty effective. I think he had 18 the other night. He was huge in their second half. Um but I, I just I see both sides of it because I, I think there is something to Arkansas's I don't want to call it dead leggedness late, but you know, they Devo said on the buzz on Thursday that, you know, he was a little winded late in the game, but he he didn't want to say that, you know, that was the reason for the missed free throws and, you know, the late misses um from the floor. I've kind of subscribed to the thought that, you know, these guys, they don't play back-to-backs unless you're at Maui or you're in some preseason tournament like in Kansas City last year they've got most of the time they've got two games a week and they're 40 minutes and with all of the dead gum media timeouts and then the coaches have their own timeouts I know Eric doesn't like to doesn't like to call many timeouts of his own but you know a lot of the coaches that he goes against they they do and I was thinking about like when Chris Jans was just totally mucking up the game last weekend with like mm-hmm. these random timeouts. Um, I just think that there's enough stoppages in games to get guys breathers. And I think that's where Eric kind of falls. He's like, we've got all these breaks in the game. You've got a halftime. Most of the time you've got two days or three days before a game. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think there's something to – the late game struggle stemming from maybe some minutes played, especially when you're dependent uh, on, you know, play creating from, from your top three guards. Is, do you guys think that's, I mean, where do you guys stand on that? I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of, these guys are kind of in the peak of their youth. They're 21, 22 years old. I mean, AB's 18, 19 years old. These guys, I know they've got a lot of miles on them already this year, but I just see it as two games in a week. Most times, sometimes it's two games in in eight days. Um, where do you guys stand on the on the whole minutes played thing? I, I'm I'm kind of mixed at times. I, I'm with you. There there are so many breaks now with with the media timeouts. I, I don't. I hesitate to call them that because as media, we sure don't want all those timeouts. But um, you, you know, you think, wow, that guy's playing 39 minutes. You know, what if he played 32 or 33? But and I do think they have some solid, you know, young guys, Joseph Pinion, and you know, you, you wonder what what a guy like Darian Ford could do if um if if he got you know some some minutes but 
On the other hand, if you lose a game and you know you you only played Anthony Black 33 and you're like man I, my best player I sat him for 7 minutes right and, and eric said on the radio I was radio show the other night um that I don't have the quote in front of me something like a tired anthony black is still better than you know 90% of the players out there and i it'd be hard to argue with that and um so you know and and also it's it's eric's mo right i mean he, he as the season goes on, he shortens the bench. He he goes with, you know, maybe seven guys. Maybe an eighth guy gets in there for a little bit. Obviously, it depends on foul trouble. He, he tends to play more bigs because they're getting in foul trouble more often. I mean, you want know, how many minutes would the Twins play if they weren't getting in foul trouble? Oh yeah, I mean Arkansas went you know? four deep in the front court the other night because yeah. three of yeah. them got in foul trouble. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, big guys, it's a little harder to get that 6'10", 6'9", body up and down the court. So I don't know if you'd see those guys playing 36 minutes or something. But um, but this is the way Eric's coached for a long time. So he's been very successful. I think, you know, if if uh, you know, if they had Trevor Brazil and Nick Smith hadn't gotten hurt, they were, you know, they had 20 wins right now or 22 wins or whatever. I don't think anybody would be saying anything about minutes. So I just think – you know, it's it, it's a style or a system or whatever you want to call it. This worked pretty well for Eric Musselman. So you can agree or disagree, but it's not like this is something that's foreign to him. This is the way he's coached, and he's been pretty successful doing it this way. Yeah, I think you guys are spot on. And I think, you know, I understand Eric's philosophy with trying to win with your best players, best players on the floor against the opposing team's bench players. And, I mean, more often than not, he's been, been successful at it, like you said. Uh, but I just think maybe in a game where you kind of saw them faltering in the second half against A&M, and maybe you at least try uh, to get one of your guys a breather and see if that helps. Because I think Arkansas and Eric Musselman's team specifically expect to play at such an intense level with, with that just – you need so much energy to play at the level that you're expected to uh, when you play for an Eric Musselman team. And I think when you see guys that aren't playing up to their standard, like we've seen all all the all of the starters that get those minutes, we've seen how elite they can play. Uh, when you see that they're not playing to their typical standard, I think maybe that's a time where you do try to get them a breather and try to try to get them some rest and maybe throw them back into the game. And then on the other, and I also think uh, to that point that. We've talked a lot about this team being the deepest team that Eric's had at throughout his tenure, uh, and, and I know he doesn't like to go deep into his bench. But uh, if you're if you're having those struggles with guys and their conditioning, and you're having the team with the most depth you've ever had, it does seem like a logical solution would be to use it. Uh, but obviously, he's he's a very successful coach, and and he knows what he's doing. I think some of it too with guys playing heavy minutes is those are the dudes that he trusts the most. And I think there's a there's a pretty obvious emphasis placed on the defensive end of the floor. Like, you know, Jalen Graham the other night played pretty well. It was the first time this season he played more than two minutes and did not turn the ball over. And he still didn't play in the second half. But here's a interesting fact for you guys. Um, I kept track of the field goals defended for each Arkansas player during the A&M game. If you're Wondering why Graham maybe didn't play more than he did. Makai and Mikel Mitchell held Texas A&M to two of 21 shooting the other night when they were the nearest Arkansas defender to a shot. And one of the scores that Mikel gave up, um, I gave him, I gave, I gave him the bucket against him, or I gave Mikel the tally in terms of like A&M scored on him because he committed a foul on Wade Taylor after he got by Ricky Council. And I don't even know if that's entirely fair to Mikel, but I just think there's a definite emphasis placed on the defensive end of the floor and rebounding, especially in a game like A&M. Like I get that that Jalen Graham played pretty well the other night, and you know maybe if he stays on the floor a little bit longer, he can give you some more buckets. And you know Arkansas is not exactly lighting it up on the offensive end, but um, if he's on the floor, maybe A&M scores a lot more than it does. I mean. So you gave up what sixty two points and you feel like you played pretty good. The Mitchells were were a big, big, big part of that. Um we get into Nick Smith, I guess. He came back um last week. I guess last Wednesday Eric said he was pretty optimistic that he was gonna come back. 
um, in the near future. He comes back to play 17 minutes against Mississippi State. I think he had five points on two of seven shooting. Um, then on Wednesday at A&M, put him in for a little bit. I think he, I think Arkansas was minus one in the four minutes that he played. He had a shot blocked in transition, turned it over a couple times. I think that was, you could see him. He's trying to get caught up to the speed of the game, get 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 back into a, get back into a rhythm or a flow of some kind. And Eric just pulled the plug pretty quickly, and he stuck with the guys that have gotten Arkansas to this point in the season. Uh, what are y'all's impressions, if any? I know he's only played like 21 minutes since he's been back, but do you guys have any impressions or what what ways have you seen Arkansas maybe change for better or worse with him on the floor since he's been back? Yeah, he, he just he he's just rusty, you know. To me, I mean, he he missed, you know, nearly two months, and it's not just you're not playing the games, you're not practicing. He may have been shooting baskets on the side or doing whatever, but I remember when we talked to him when he came back the first time. And he had a couple of good games, you know, a good game against OU. He's getting ready for Bradley, which turned out to be his last game for quite a while. And um, he talked about getting your legs back was probably the biggest challenge. And and he hadn't missed as much time then as he as he has now. And I think the dilemma Arkansas is facing is, is a catch twenty two because you 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 want you know you want a Nick Smith, you know, playing at the top of his game to really help you you know, win down the stretch of these big SEC games, which hopefully will get you in the NCAA tournament, and then you can make a run and all that. But they're not playing San Jose State and Troy. Right. And Greensboro. They're playing at A&M. And, um, you know, they got Florida coming up, which is a huge game. You know, they got they got to win all these home games. And, and Mississippi State, and, and I'm like you, Scotty, I certainly did not expect Arkansas to win that game. But I also think people need to give Mississippi State some credit because they were playing pretty well. I know they got lost a tough one to Kentucky the other night. They were playing pretty well. They played really tough defense. They really make the game ugly. And they just came in and beat Arkansas. You got to give them credit for that. But that was a very tough game to me to come back to if you're Nick Smith or anybody, because you're Absolutely, playing one of the yeah. best you're playing one of the best defensive teams in the country. It's a super high level game. I'm sure he's feeling pressured. I'm Nick Smith. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the best players in the country. I'm a high NBA draft pick. And so there's just a lot of moving parts to this. And, you know, Eric has got to try to find a way to give Nick the minutes he needs to get back in the groove, but also not hurt the team because this isn't a, this isn't a preseason game. It's not a non-conference game. It's a real, these are high level SEC games. So it, it's a dilemma, but Eric Musselman gets paid a lot of money. To, to figure this stuff out and so i think he'll he'll figure it out yeah i largely i largely like the shots that he took last saturday against uh mississippi state and was i was really a fan of kind of the way that he changed the the tempo the pace of the game especially in that second half so mississippi state would have been totally fine playing like a 40 possession game like to be real honest like they get an offensive rebound you know, after they melt the shot clock all the way down, they I may mean, play 50 second possession against Mississippi State. They're, they're totally fine with that. And then they'll go down on the other. Like, it doesn't matter what their offense does. Like, they're not a team that's whose defense is dictated based on their offense. Like, they're just going to lock you up regardless. And Jans, Chris Jans is perfectly fine winning like a 40 to 30 game, too. Um, so Nick coming in and providing a little bit of a boost, even though he didn't shoot the ball that great. I think he's just – he's one of those guys who's so talented on the offensive end and he's capable of either scoring or creating pretty much any time he wants. I think I think he's got that mentality that he can do that. And doing it early in a shot clock, you know, I think that speeds the game up a little bit. Um, I looked at Hoopland's uh, – one of my analytics subscription sites yesterday – Arkansas scored 1.12 points per possession in the 34 possessions he played against Mississippi State. When he sat, they scored 0 0.72 points per possession. So it was a pretty stark contrast. But again, um, he played against Texas A&M the other night. The offense wasn't wasn't clicking. The defense was okay. The defense against Mississippi State when he was on the floor was pretty average. But the offense was um, the offense was clicking was clicking pretty good. So um, that's how Arkansas was able to make a little bit of a comeback. The Basketball Podcast of Mid-America is sponsored by Landers Toyota of Northwest Arkansas. Visit their showroom at 411 South Metro Parkway in Rogers or online at LandersToyotaNWA.com. 
For all your automotive needs, shop Landers Toyota NWA in Rogers, where we guarantee you the best buying experience and best service after the sale in Arkansas. Landers Toyota NWA in Rogers. Wholehogsports.com has the largest, most experienced staff of reporters covering sports in Arkansas. Football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. You'll find it at wholehogsports.com. The website includes up-to-minute news, daily commentaries, and award-winning photography from the staffs of Hogs Illustrated and the Democrat Gazette. For subscriptions, call 1-800-757-6277. That's 1-800-757-6277. Or visit us online today. Wholehogsports.com. Com. Want more coverage of your home team? Download the Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Check out the Fan Zone and get up-to-the-minute videos, podcasts, and features on football, basketball, baseball, recruiting, and more. Search for Whole Hog Sports on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire at home. And take it with you on the go by downloading it for your mobile device in your app store. The Whole Hog Sports Video On Demand app. Get it today. You know, another thing I think is interesting is that if you look at at least the last starting line for Florida, they start four guards. And we know Castleton's out, and they'll probably start the, the big guy, um, Jit Oba. I'm not sure you say his yeah. name, but yeah, he's, but, a, he's, a, he's a mountain. Yeah, yeah he's so I think he's like 6'11, 500 pounds or something. He's, <laughs> Kim, he's a Kim big Pong, dude. Kim Pong Page has got him at a solid 300. Okay, he's a big dude. He's a big boy. And, and, but but the thing is, if they're playing four guards on there, then I wonder would Arkansas play? You know, I don't know if they'd start Nick, but I think this is a, this is a more doable thing at home. Is that you know maybe you have Devo, Ricky Council, AB, and Nick going to going going at these guys, and and I think it's easier. I just think you know Nick would feel more comfortable at home. And he's had a couple more practices. Obviously, they're not going, you know, they're not scrimmaging these practices and going heavy duty, but right. he's, he's got a little more time. I mean, one thing I remember distinctly from that Mississippi State game late was, you know, I can't remember what the score was. It was close. I was fighting to come back. A couple, a couple minutes left, and AB's got the ball, and Nick's on the wing, and Nick starts to cut in to the basket, and Anthony throws the ball away because he threw it where he thought Nick was going to be. And that's just to me that's just two guys that aren't used to playing together because nick's been hurt so much and so i think even these couple practices you know shoot arounds whatever the more he gets on the court with these guys in whatever setting the the better and so a home game against florida you know a team you feel like they should be able to handle at home although you know nothing's going to be easy and florida just beat Ole miss by 15 even with castleton you know only playing about 20 minutes um, you know, I, the, to me, that might set up more for, for a, a better, a better a situation to play Nick Smith, you know, bi- bigger minutes. Yeah. I, I, I think, you know, if I, Bob, I sent you the transcript of the, mm-hmm. the interview that Devo did with, uh, I believe it was Westmore and Justin Acre on Thursday on the, on the buzz. And he's, you know, they asked like, how do you guys get more comfortable with Nick? Is it, can it be done in practice? Like, can you build that synergy in practice or does it have to come in game? And D- Debo said it has to come in a game because I mean, and Eric has even alluded to this, that, you know, you're in the, gr- the you're in like the meat grinder of the season. You've got like, so this week you've got just Thursday and Friday to prep for Florida. How much do you think you're going up and down? Probably not, probably not a whole lot. And Devo's like, you know, we haven't really scrimmaged with Nick because we don't do that a whole lot in practice it's 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 going to be interesting i think that i think that the castleton injury is going to make this game so much more guard oriented and i think you're exactly right and kind of um i was going to ask you guys later in a uh, in another segment whether there was going to be a lineup change just because i think the castleton thing or the castleton injury changes a lot i don't feel like you'll see both of the twins um, in this game, it could be a game where Jordan Walsh starts and maybe one of the twins is first big off the bench and maybe Nick might be your first or second, you know, perimeter guy off the bench. So we'll we'll have to see. But uh, I, I do th- definitely think it's got to come in game. And, and you know, Nick, since Nick only played four minutes against Texas A&M, his legs should be pretty, pretty fresh, I would think. So 
really curious to see how that's going to go out, uh, going to you know, turn out. And I'm also curious for you guys' thoughts on where Arkansas kind of stands in terms of the postseason right now. I just looked at, before we started recording, I looked at Joe Lenardi's latest projections, and Arkansas is not a team that's considered officially on the bubble. Um, right now, the SEC bubble teams are Mississippi State and Kentucky. He's actually got Kentucky and North Carolina in an 11 versus 11 play in game. Isn't that crazy? Like the number one preseason number one team against another team that, that you know, was Kentucky picked to finish first in the league this year, Bob? By, yeah, yeah. By the media said so that isn't that like a crazy, yeah. that's just been a crazy year in, in, in the sport in general. Yeah, Kentucky was one, Arkansas was two in the media poll. Of course, and then I think Kentucky opened the season in the top five. So yeah, right. Kentucky North Carolina playing game that would be that would be nuts. That, that would be pretty wild. That'd be like uh, Alabama and Georgia playing in the Independence Bowl or something, you know? <laughs> right. Those, going more into those projections. Um, get this: he's got Arkansas as a ten seed right now. First round matchup would be San Diego State. <laughs> so how how interesting with that i don't think that's a game that anybody would be like no i'm not interested in that there's especially with after the after all the fireworks that happened the first time that the those teams met that game would be played in denver obviously this we're still a long ways out from selection sunday um it'll be here before you know it though you know that um potential second round game baylor so how about that like pretty pretty interesting projections um, seems like there's been talk that our, all Arkansas has got to do to comfortably get in the field is chalk, right? Win at home, maybe, maybe be really competitive in the two road games against Tennessee and Alabama, which pretty tough to win at those places as we've seen. Are, are, are you guys, do you guys subscribe to that? Does Arkansas just need to go three and two down the stretch to, to feel pretty good? That would put them at what, 20, 20 and 11 going into the league tournament. I think so. And, and, um, you know, you look at their net, I think they're 23 unless something's changed. So, and, you know, losing at A&M, that's not a bad loss at all. Um, and matter of fact, you know, A&M was favored. You, you know, they've only lost one game at home all year to Wofford <laughs> when they were trying to figure things out, but a and a lot different team than they were in December. They're a lot better. And so, you know, that Kentucky game, <clears throat> even though Kentucky's struggling a little bit, uh, I think winning at Lexington that 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 always counts for, for for something big, and so um, you know that gave Arkansas a little margin for error, which you know dissipated when they lost at home to Mississippi State. But yeah, I think if they win these three home games, that'll be big. That especially since Kentucky's one of them, and I think Kentucky's you know getting things figured out a little bit. The, but, you know, everybody, the reason CBS, I assume, put that Arkansas-Kentucky game at the end of the year on CBS was because they thought that'd be, you know, top 10 matchup, maybe two teams playing for the SEC championship. And now the stakes are going to be high because it could be that Kentucky might need that win to secure an NCAA bid, get off that bubble, and Arkansas might need it too. So it could be, you know, it's going to be a really important game. But first they got to take care of Florida and Georgia. And then I think if they win those three and as long as they don't go to Nashville and, you know, lay a big, you know, get beat in the first, you know, game or something, um, I think they'll probably be okay. Yeah, I know it probably hasn't been the season most Arkansas fans were expecting to have, but I, I definitely don't think all hope is lost. And I think probably the most comforting thing is that Arkansas does, in, in my opinion, still control their own destiny. Like they don't have to rely on, on other teams' results to get in. I think if they do just kind of win the games they're favored to at home, that they'll be fine. Uh, obviously, that the games at Alabama and Tennessee are are like expected losses. It's like pretty they tough. Really, so if they do somehow sneak away a win, like that's just gravy. The good part about having those games is that the losses against those teams don't really matter. Uh, so you can you can play freely and and just try to go out there and steal one. Um, but I don't I don't know what do you you're you're the analytics guy. What do you what <laughs> metric do you think is like the most important? I really think they've got to win this weekend. Like if they don't, I think their their chances take a nosedive because you look at the remaining games, you got Georgia at home. That's a game that just like you've got to win it or it's just like what the hell is going on with your team. You can kind of let it hang out on the road a little bit, right? Like because there's not really a whole lot of people giving you much of a shot in, in those two games. 
Um, Eric is going to prepare like crazy, like he normally does for those two games, but those teams are super talented. I do think Arkansas has at least a fair shot, I would say, to maybe sneak a win at, at Tennessee. I just don't, I just don't trust that Tennessee team. I just don't think that they're offensively super, super gifted, but defensively, I mean, they just held Alabama to their lowest point total of the year. So I just, I don't, I don't know. Like I just, I see that game being like a 50, 45 rock fight potentially. Um, and then Kentucky, I think if you, I think the, the Florida games and the, the Florida and Kentucky games are really big because those are both teams that are on the bubble right now or, or Florida is at least they're in that considered category which is like after the next four teams out um and it's a team without Colin Castleton too so I feel like you've got to win that um he's one of the best bigs he's one of the best players in the conference hands down so I think you've got the you, you got to take you got to start with the Florida guys you lose that I mean you might be you might go from 10 seed to you know the next four out potentially and then you've got a pretty tough finish with Alabama, Tennessee, and Kentucky. Like that's 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 not easy. Um let's see. A B is playing pretty well. I just saw um I think it was a mock draft. May have been from the athletic. He's projected to be Arkansas's highest draft pick um in in this upcoming draft. I think he's firmly in the top ten. Do you guys think that he's comfortably in the lottery at this point, or do you think he's got to show anything else to kind of cement himself as you know one of those surefire lottery guys? Yeah, to, to me, he's a lottery pick because he just does so many things. I just, I mean, the minutes he's played is really impressive, and we know he's been banged up. Eric's alluded to that. They thought he wouldn't, or they thought he might not play against a And M here, which turned out to be a huge game for Arkansas. And he ended up playing, I don't know, 35, 36 minutes. And he just seems to give them what they need, whether it's scoring, assists, rebounds. He's an elite defender. You know, he, he, I think he's got 16 or 17 block shots, which, you know, Oscar, he might have more block shots this season than Oscar Sheepway. I mean, and, uh, and he's only 19. And we know the NBA, you know, loves, you know, the, the younger you are, the, the higher your ceiling, I think. And so, um, I mean, that's the thing. Let's say he's having a bad shooting game for whatever reason. He can impact the game in so many other ways, you know, with his passing and the way he's – and I think he'd really rather set a guy up than get a bucket, but sometimes he knows he needs to do that. And uh, yeah, I think his perimeter shooting's improved. And, um, you know, just to seeing what a young kid is doing for an SEC program, he's had to take on so much with Nick Smith and Trevor Brazell out. And so – yeah, to me, he's just he's just, and he just seems like a really good kid, and he's got a good head on his shoulders. And uh, you, I don't know how much the NBA puts stock on this when he does interviews with us. He, to me, he just seems so mature. He's, uh, you know, he takes responsibility and just um, you know, he's accountable. I guess is what I'm trying yeah, to no say. Doubt. So to me, that he's just got, you know, pluses on so many so many categories. Yeah, I really think he's come on as a defender lately. Like right now, I looked at his Ken Palm page not too long ago. He's top 10 in the conference and still rate, you know, and he's being counted on to do so much. And then he had eight of – he didn't score the ball great the other night. I think he was like one of five on two-point shots until like the last 20 seconds of the game. But I think he matched a season high with eight assists. Those assists turned into 23 points because he found guys for threes you know, two point buckets to like Mikel and Makai Mitchell. And then, then, you know, he's, he's setting up like when Arkansas shoots threes that he sets up they're they're like, I don't want to say they turn into golden state warriors, but they're, they're shooting like at least 40%. Like I, I was keeping track of that early in conference play the other night, they were three of six on threes that, that he set up. So that's, I think that's something to always keep an eye on just how Arkansas shoots the ball on, on AB created threes. I, uh, I mentioned this earlier that we we're going to get into some over unders, um, some prop bets for the games. I know you guys are big time sports gamblers, like like I am. So I'll start with Mikel Mitchell over or under two and a half blocks. M- M- Mikel, I-, I will take the over on that. Okay, yeah, Mikel's on like a he's on a heater in terms of blocking shots. A- a- uh, Andrew, what you got? Uh, I would take the over if uh, Castleton was, was in, uh, just because I think that would lead to Mikel getting more minutes. But uh, I'll take the under just because I think Makai is going to be the guy for them. 
I, I I'm with you, Andrew. I went under two. I just don't see Florida really feeding the ball to the the mountain that they still have in their front court. I just don't think that they're he's going to be like a central part of of what they do outside of maybe setting ball screens to try to create some airspace. I'm going to go under there. Okay, over or under four and a half made threes for Arkansas. I'm going to go under because part of it is I don't think they're going to shoot as many threes. I mean, you look at Kentucky, what were they, four out of nine in that yes. game? They, they scored a lot of points in the paint. They scored a lot of free throws. They got a lot of points off turnovers. I don't know if they can force that many turnovers on the Gators, but um, I think for Arkansas to win, they need to limit their threes. So I will take the under on that. Yeah, I'm going to go under. Arkansas is not a three-point shooting team, but then – you know, I say that, and then they'll they'll shoot ten for fifteen from three. But we'll, <laughs> we'll see. I went over just because I think it's going to be more of a guard oriented game, like I mentioned earlier. But at the same time, Eric is probably saying that Colin Castleton is not, you know, the goal the goalie, so to speak, for Florida, and so attack the rim relentlessly. I'm going over, even though my heart is telling me that it's going to go under. Um, real quick, Florida over or under six and a half made threes I, i'm gonna go over because not i think arkansas will play good perimeter defense but i think especially with castleton out i think florida's gonna have to shoot a lot of threes to have a shot to win yeah i'll go over i think especially if they they get down they're gonna have to start even some long range threes they have to catch up and they'll probably hit a few i'm gonna go over as well that's just i think that's gonna be Florida's kind of mo in this game without a, you know, without their top top front line guy. Bob, did you say or Andrew? Did you say over or under? I'm sorry. I'm going with the over. Okay. Um, Nick Smith over or under nine and a half points. I'm going to go over because I think he's he's going to play more. I think it'd be you know one thing he's obviously not used to coming off the bench. I know he played that restricted six minutes against Troy, whoever it was, but especially at home i say hey man i mean assuming he's healthy and feeling good and everything i'd I'd say start him because that's what he's used to doing and maybe that's something that could get him going to starting him so um, i'm gonna say over on that i i'm smashing the over i I think he's gonna have 15 plus i think he just needs to see the ball go through the hoop and then he'll, he'll get it going yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna go over too i think there's gonna be a definite comfortability with him at home and you know i think ab and devo are just gonna they're gonna be looking to maybe try to get him going and that's i think that would that would really 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 energize the crowd um i think we've kind of mentioned this already but lineup change yes or no do you see you think one of the mitchell one of the mitchells sits maybe jordan walsh gets a start how how do you see that yeah i agree with with um I think Florida's going to have four guards. And so, you know, Eric's a lot about matchups. No offense to the Mitchells. They're good defenders. I don't know if I see one of them chasing around a 6'3 guy on the perimeter. So, yeah, I would think they would start. Personally, and, you know, obviously nobody's paying me to coach, but I'd start Nick Smith. But, yeah, if not Nick, then Jordan Walsh. Yeah, I'll go with the lineup change, too. I think Jordan Walsh probably starts, may stick with Makai in the front court um is i think he's the more nimble of the of the two guys more able to to maybe check guards on the perimeter on switches and and things like that um appreciate you guys joining us today and um putting up with the over-unders and and everything that uh, we got into today arkansas and florida will tip off at one o'clock on espn2 on saturday from bud walton arena arkansas really really needs this game and you know, I think if if Arkansas puts together a, a pretty good performance, it could, you know, shoot them, give them some confidence going into Georgia next week, and then a couple big road games. So, um, for Bob Holt and Andrew Joseph, I'm Scotty Bordelon. Appreciate you guys listening to the basketball podcast of Mid America this week. We'll holler at you again later. The proceeding has been a production of WholeHogSports.com. Look for our latest podcasts on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast store. And visit us anytime at wholehogsports.com for the latest news and commentary.